The topic for our study today is the last days. You know, we have in the Bible this phrase, the last days. And we want to use as the text Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Let us begin by noticing this text from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, where the phrase, the last days, appears. Here the Bible says, God who at sundry times, that means different times, and in diverse manners, that is varying manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. This is a marvelous statement telling about how God speaks to us today. He speaks to us by his Son. His Son doesn't speak to us directly, but rather we are taught, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. In Colossians 3, 16, the word of God is how Christ speaks to us today. But I want you to notice he says, in these last days, he has spoken unto us by his Son. Now this passage was written in the book of Hebrews, which was written in the late 60s AD. Yet, this phrase applies to today, these last days. And that illustrates how this phrase is used in our Bible. And we want to examine that phrase, the last days. So the title of our lesson is The Last Days. And our text is Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, where the last days is clearly used to refer to a time that extends from the first century all the way until now. Now, in thinking about the last days, many times people look at the last days and it seems like, and honestly it seems like, this might be talking about the last days just before the second coming of Christ. And that's usually the way the phrase last days is being referenced. But what we want to study today is that's not how the last days as a phrase is used in our Bible. And we want to show that. Now, in thinking about how the last days is used by some to talk about, we're living in the last days, implying that these are the last days before the return of Christ. I think it's good for us to point out that there are no signs that precede the second coming of Christ. A passage, for example, that is famous in this connection to disprove that is 1 Thessalonians 5 at verse 3, where we learn that the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That's also found in 2 Peter 3, but get the phrase. The Lord comes how? Like a thief in the night. He doesn't come with announcement. He doesn't come in such a way that we can forecast the time of his return. In fact, you may know that in Mark chapter 13, if you look at verse 31 to 37, Jesus makes it clear that nobody knows when he's returning. And that's something for us to underscore, especially in view of the ideas that people have about knowing that Christ is just near to returning. It's just about to happen by looking at various events in world developments. Well, sometimes when people talk like this, they use phraseology that is not found in the Bible. And today I'd like to contrast our study on the last days and, and the beginning here with some phrases that are not found in the Bible. I would like to illustrate this by a book that was really famous many years ago, written by Hal Lindsey. I think it was the real start of the popularization of this rapture theory. Some, that's the way some people just know it. Oh, the rapture. By that they mean the silent return of Christ to take people up from the earth, followed by a seven-year period of tribulation that's unprecedented, and then that forecasts or foretells the second coming of Christ where he'll establish his kingdom on earth. There are a lot of things wrong with that biblically, but the thing I want to point out just now is the idea of the rapture. It is not found in the Bible. That word is not found in the Bible. In Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, I'm really dating myself when I mention that because that's an old book, but it was one of the most popular ones. And to this day, the theory as advanced by Hal Lindsey continues to be the popular theory of premillennialism or the rapture idea. On page 137 of the Late Great Planet Earth, Hal Lindsey says rapture, the word rapture, is not in the Bible. Okay, that's what I'm telling you. And here you have the leading premillennialist of our generation by way of popularity telling us that the rapture is not in the Bible. Now he'll say there are verses in the Bible that really tell about the rapture, but the word, we're talking about the word, it is not in the Bible. And that's quite a telling notion that you have a whole concept that revolves around a word 
that is not found in the Bible. I find it interesting that the verse of Scripture that is often pointed to for the rapture and by which they mean the silent return of Christ is one of the loudest verses in all the Bible. And that would be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We have to have expert help to make this passage apply to a silent return of Christ. The passage is 1 Thessalonians 4, and the verse is down here in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now, that's usually as far as they go, and they stop right there. Oh, that's the rapture. This is a rapture passage. Then being snatched up or caught up. However, look at what the verse goes on to say. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What do you have? Christ returning with a shout and the trumpet. You know what trumpet that is? In 1 Corinthians 15, it's the last trumpet. So here the premillennialists and the rapture people tell you, rapture's not in the Bible, but the thing is, and it's in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Well, no, it's not. Why would we let somebody play that kind of a shell game with us in making us believe something the Bible doesn't teach? The Bible is the word of God. We are to speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. Long ago, Isaiah said in Isaiah 8, 20, that if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And over in the New Testament, Paul tells young Timothy, preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, 2. That's why in this program, as well as in the teaching and preaching we do in the Church of Christ, you'll hear us referring to book, chapter, and verse because we're to be preaching the word. And we like to highlight that by giving you the passage. That way you can look it up. Now, if people believe in the rapture, there's not a verse they can give you. You just have to take their word on it. I'm not willing to take the word of man. I want the word of God. I hope you do too, and I think you do. Now, notice too concerning this word rapture. In more recent times, in fact, just recently, a popular writer by the name of Max Lucado has weighed in on this. And he said, oh, rapture is a biblical word. And you know where he goes to get it? Does he go to the English text? No, for it's not there. Does he go to the Greek text from which we get our English text? You know, the entirety of the New Testament was written in Greek, except for some words that are Aramaic words that are interspersed, especially in the gospel accounts, a few of those. But by far and large, the New Testament, as everyone knows, is written in Greek. Therefore, the words that we have coming into English are coming from Greek. But look what Hal Lindsey says. Where is the rapture? Comes to us from what? The Latin. Is the Bible written in Latin? It's been translated into Latin by the Catholic Jerome in the fourth century, but yet it is not written in Latin. It's written in Greek. You can't go to Latin and get a word and say, well, it's the word rapture from rapto in Latin, when that word's not in neither the English nor in the Greek text. That's importing a word. And by the way, if you want to say that, I want to remind you that the Catholics and Jerome, this is really before the first Pope, the Boniface III in the year 606 AD, Jerome translated the Greek text into Latin and the Catholics don't believe in the rapture. And by the way, when you get your Catholic Bible, you won't find them in the passage that is mentioned, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, translating that by rapture. Why don't they? Because they know what I'm telling you. It's not a biblical word, and it's not a biblical concept. So here's Max Lucado trying to do some sort of exegetical cartwheels to make you think the word rapture is a legitimate word to use when it is not. He is therefore a false teacher along with Hal Lindsey. Now, there are a lot of words like that. For example, sometimes people in talking about the time immediately preceding the return of Christ, they will say those are the end times. The end times. And I've often heard it said today, a lot of times I hear preachers on the radio say, that we're living in the end times. Now there's another phrase that is not in the Bible. End times. Did you know that's not in the Bible? Why would somebody be using terminology like rapture or the end times that is not in the Bible? Well, they want to get you to go along with them. In order for you to follow their theory, they've got to convince you that they know something that you can't know by reading your own Bible. And it's about the second coming of Christ, and it's so mysterious that they know and you don't. Well, that's why they use terms like end times. Again, if we speak, we're to speak according to the word of God. First Peter 4, 
Verse 11, when somebody's using words that are not in the Bible, you need to let a red flag go up. Hal Lindsey says that on page 137 of the late great planet Earth, this ought to raise a red flag. Well, it does, Hal Lindsey. Thanks for the advice. We're going to keep raising that red flag and letting people know that you're using a word that's not in the Bible. You're inventing a doctrine. You're inventing a theme of eschatology or the end of times, and you're making it what you want to be, sort of like watching Star Wars or Star Trek or some imaginary science fiction movie. It is not in the Bible. So rapture's not in the Bible. End times is not in the Bible. Also, the end of time is a phrase that's not in the Bible. We often refer to the end of time, and then we refer to what the Bible actually says about it. But we're not trying to develop a theory. Watch this also. In the book of Daniel, there is a phrase that is repeated five times. It's called the time of the end. Well, that's the way Daniel uses that. The time of the end, it appears in the book of Daniel. Daniel writes in the 6th century before Christ, and he speaks of the time of the end, by which he means the time of the end of the prophecies that he is giving. For example, in chapter 2, where he prophesies four world empires, starting with Babylon, going to Medo-Persia, to Greece, and then to Rome. The first three mentioned in the book of Daniel, especially in Daniel chapter 10. When he says the time of the end, he's talking the time about the time when those prophecies will find their fulfillment. And you'll notice that part of the fulfillment of what he's talking about, a predominant theme, is the establishment of the kingdom of Christ on earth. Daniel 2, verse 44, when the kingdom would become a reality. He's not talking about a thousand year reign out at the end of time. He's talking about a time during the fourth world empire, the Roman Empire. That's from AD, or rather from BC 63 to AD 176. Sometime during that Roman Empire, when it's at its pinnacle, the kingdom of Christ would be established. Compare Daniel 2, Isaiah 2, Joel 2, and Acts 2, and you'll see that being fulfilled. That's the way Daniel uses the phrase, the time of the end. He's not talking about the second coming of Christ at the end of the world. He's talking about when his prophecies are going to be fulfilled. You can read in Daniel those five times that the phrase, the time of the end, appears. They are in Daniel 8, 17, Daniel 11, 35, Daniel 11, 40, Daniel 12, 4, and Daniel 12, 9. Those are five times that the prophet Daniel references the time of the end in regard to his prophecies being fulfilled the kingdom of Christ or the church of Christ being ushered in and the kingdom that now stands. It's a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one. The writer of Hebrews, for example, says, Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So I want you to notice that the kingdom is prophesied in Daniel and it was the time of the end when those prophecies would be fulfilled. Now, Let's go to our thoughts today on the last days. The last days is a phrase that has a biblical meaning and an important meaning for us to understand. We've already seen in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, that Christ is speaking to us, God is speaking to us today through Christ in these last days. And we've established in part that the last days must be a time that is not isolated at the first century or out at the end of time when Christ returns. But rather, it is a time from the first century all the way till now and till the end of time. There are for us, notice these seven passages of Scripture, seven passages of Scripture where the last days is found. Now, if you get your concordance, you'll find the last days in places like Genesis 49.1, and there he doesn't have a reference to the last days as used in these verses, but rather to the time of the fulfillment of the prophecies that are made by Jacob there concerning his sons. But these phrases, the last days, appearing in these verses, all have reference to the same time period. And I want to give you the answer. The last days is a reference to the Christian age. What is the Christian age? It is the time from the resurrection of Christ, the establishment of the church, until Christ returns again. That period of time, or age, has now been about 2,000 years. Notice that. 
These are the last days. We are living in the last days. I think I need to comment about that because that sounds strange, doesn't it? 2,000 years and it's the last days? Why would the Bible talk about last days and it's not years or decades or centuries or millennia, but last days? Isn't that odd? I'll tell you why. There is a sense of urgency associated with referring to the Christian age as the last days. It reminds us that our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away, James 4, verse 14. It reminds us that our days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, as Job mentions in his great book. I think that's chapter 14. If you don't find it there, just read all 42 chapters. You'll enjoy that. It's in there. Our days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Our time here is brief. And the Lord wanted to focus our attention on it like he does in the verses I mentioned earlier in Mark 13, 31 to 37, where Jesus says, no one knows when he's returning. And then the key word in that section is therefore watch. Be watching and be prepared for his coming because you don't know when it is. No one does. So now with that in mind, I'd like you to notice that we have this phrase, the last days. Let's look at some of these passages. Go with me, if you will, to Joel chapter 2 in verse 28. Now, Joel is a prophet. I think he's prophesying in the 9th century B.C. That takes you way back into the recesses of Hebrew history. The 9th century B.C. is going to put you all the way back very near to the United Kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon, isn't it? That's right. Daniel, an ancient prophet. He has a statement that he makes in Daniel 2.28 that is quoted by Peter in Acts 2, verse 17. I put these on the screen for your benefit for those of you who are watching by television and not listening on the radio. And I want you to notice that you'll find the fulfillment of Joel 2.28 in Acts 2.17. So let's read those two verses together. And we realize that Isaiah and Micah are sandwiched in between there on the chart. But let's look at Joel 2.28. Here's what Joel says. And it shall come to pass afterward. Now when Peter quotes that, he says in the last days in Acts 2.17, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Notice this reference. There's, there's much more to be said about this coming time known as the last days. So that's Joel in the ninth century B.C. Let's flip forward a thousand years to Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Now here, this is the day of Pentecost. It's the day the church is established. This is the day after, the time after Christ was crucified, buried, and rose again. It is now 50 days after the crucifixion of Christ. And now then in Acts 2, Peter is preaching. This is the first recorded gospel sermon and convincing the Jews that they were guilty of the crucifixion of Christ and crucifying their own Messiah, he brings out this point to let them know the things that are happening are not just by chance, or he's not just making this up, but rather these are a product, these things are a product of Old Testament prophecy. He quotes Joel in Acts 2 and verse 17 and says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This, what you're seeing here in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. This is that which was spoken by Joel, Joel 2.28. And then he quotes him. It shall come to pass in the last days. We see, therefore, that the last days begin on the day of Pentecost. The last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And then he goes on further to talk about that and the big change that's coming with the change from Judaism to Christianity. He'll discuss all that in the prophetic language he's quoting from Joel chapter 2. But I want you to notice for the purposes of our study today that the phrase, the last days, begins in Acts 2. We already saw that it's continuing in the late 60s AD, for that is what the writer of Hebrews has said. God has spoken to us by his son in these last days. Now let's go back and get a little more. Let's fill in a few of these blanks in our thinking in regard to what is meant by the last days 
by going back to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, verses 1, we like to notice through verse 3. Isaiah 2, 1 through 3. Now, I want to tell you, I've got these passages on the screen, Isaiah 2 and Micah 4. Isaiah and Micah are contemporary. That is, they live at the same time. And they live in the 8th century B.C. They live about 759 to about 699 B.C. So they're living before the time of Christ, but they come about 200 years after Joel. Notice what the prophets, and since they're both saying the same thing, you can read about it and talking about the same thing and using the term the last days in the same way, I'll just read for the sake of time from Isaiah 2, 1 through 3, if that'll be all right. All right, Isaiah 2. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Watch this. We've got a geographical reference, Judah and Jerusalem. What he's talking about relates to that point on the globe, Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days. That's an occurrence of our phrase, the last days. That the, what will happen? The mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is the place where the law of the Lord would go forth. Now notice that doesn't happen after Isaiah till you get to Acts 2. And you'll notice that what Peter is doing is as an, as an authoritative spokesman for Christ, he himself being an apostle, he's letting you know here is the new law of Christ being put forward by the apostles. It's happening at Jerusalem. Well, he said all nations would flow into it. What does that mean? In Acts 2 verse 16, we find there were, in fact, in verse 1, we find there are devout Jews out of every nation under heaven gathered at Jerusalem. They're gathered to observe the Jewish feast days commanded in places like Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23. And then in verse 16 of Acts 2, there are 16 nations that are listed there to identify from where all these people come. That, Acts 2, is the fulfillment of Isaiah 2. It's just like what Peter said about Joel. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He may have easily said and correctly said, this is that which was spoken by Isaiah in Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. What is the mountain of the Lord's house? Quite clearly, it is the church that Peter speaks of when he says those who gladly received his word were baptized. That is, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins in Acts 2, 38. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. And you know what the Lord did with them? He added them to his church, Acts 2.47. That is the first time we read about the church being a reality, being in existence. It began in Acts 2. That's prophesied in the Old Testament, but it began in Acts 2. Jesus spoke of it in his personal ministry. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. The rock there is the truth that he's the son of God. Based upon this, I'm going to build whose church? My church. How does he do that? Through the apostles. You see that in his statements to them in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. Now it's coming about in Acts 2. Really, it's a key chapter in the Bible. I remember lectureships where Acts 2 was presented as the hub of the Bible. And the Old Testament prophecies point to Acts 2. Statements later in the New Testament point back to Acts 2. In previous studies in past years, I've tried to bring a lesson myself on the hub of the Bible, Acts 2, because it's such a key chapter. Remember a minute ago I was giving you some twos in the Bible? It will be a very interesting study that you can do, and you don't even need to write it down. You can remember it. Study from Joel 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Acts 2. And it will be amazing what you learn about the Church of Christ. The church that's in the Bible is what I mean by the Church of Christ. Certainly not a denomination, but the Church of the Bible, the church that Jesus built. We can actually be members of that by doing what the Bible says. That's why I say I'm a member of the Church of Christ. I can read about it in my Bible, Romans 16, 16. I can know that the Savior added to it by the Lord himself, Acts 2, 47. So in thinking about the last days, the last days is a phrase in our Bible that points to the Christian age, the time from the establishment of the church 
till the time when Christ returns, whenever that is. Again, I emphasize, we don't know when that is. If somebody tells you we know when that is, you know already he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because Jesus said, no man can know when he's going to return, so you be watchful. And I love the emphasis of the last days because it places the stress upon the brevity of the time we have here and now to do the Lord's work. We cannot procrastinate the Lord's work. We're to be about his business. Now, if you're looking at this chart on the screen, you see two other passages and you're wondering, how in the world is he ever going to talk about them verses in the next minute and a half? I'll tell you how. I'm going to read them. In the book of 2 Peter, rather 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, notice how Paul refers to the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 1, he says, Know this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, some people stop there and say, oh, it's talking about the second coming of Christ. But when you read this, he's talking about people behaving in such a way as to be characteristic of mankind from the establishment of the church all the way to the second coming of Christ. I would implore you to read the chapter because I'm out of time. The last passage is 2 Peter 3.3. 3. Here Peter says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. See, there would be no, no signs that they could point to. And that's what's pointed out there in 2 Peter 3. Thank you for your study with us today about the last days. Don't ever be misguided or misled about it. You've got the seven verses that mention it now under our belt, and we know more about the last days. May we live in such a way to use this time most profitably for our eternal salvation. Thank you.